2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll skip down to chapter 6. So 2 Samuel, Samuel uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word, eternally true. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. Now skip down to chapter 6 and verse 1. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark on a cart, a new cart, and brought it from the house of Abinadab, who was on the hill, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom in everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to whom the city or to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, the son of Saul, watched him from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father 
or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us in the top right of our bulletins this morning. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We look today at really four, four Palm Sundays. Uh, this, this text here is, is the first. But we look at four different Palm Sundays in Scripture. And, and I want you, as you, you, you get a sense of uh, Palm Sunday being good news, to have in your mind or maybe in that, you know how you, you smell something and, and your mind takes you to a certain place. When I smell Dove soap and Crest toothpaste, I, I think about being in the, the bathroom I used at my grandfather's house because we used Colgate and we didn't use Dove soap. But in my grandfather's house, he had Dove soap and, Col and, and Crest toothpaste for us there. The old, you know, basic Crest uh, there, wintergreen, whatever that flavor was that, that Crest used. Um, the the non-manly, you know, Colgate is, was like, you know, that woke you up, right? Uh, <laughs> those of you who are old enough remember that. Uh, but but the smell has a certain effect on our on our minds, and it puts us in a certain mood. Uh, last night, uh, Tess and I were listening to some songs on on the radio, and they were all coming from the 70s, and I was looking up and seeing when that song was out, when it hit the charts, and saying, okay, I was, that was when I was going into the sixth grade. Uh, that was the very begin, beginning of kindergarten for me, and, and certain emotions come out. The emotion you're to get from this text is, is something you see here with what David gives as, as parting gifts, as they'd say on the game shows today, to all those who experienced the Ark of God coming, coming into Jerusalem. Um, you know that smell. Uh, on on uh, Thanksgiving morning and Christmas morning, I make cinnamon rolls. Uh, and so I get up, and I go running, and everyone's still asleep. I come in, and when I think it's about time where it'll come out just at the perfect time, I, I make cinnamon rolls for my family. And so they wake up to that, that smell of cinnamon rolls. Or you know how it is when you're at the mall, and you go by Cinnabon. Right, uh, that smell, and that's a good thing, and, and unless you're trying to lose weight, and, and I wonder if in the new heavens and new earth we'll have the Cinnabon store that will be, it'll be free, and and it won't cause us to to gain weight or bad things to happen to us. We won't have to worry about diabetes or anything like that uh, in the future. But uh, this is this is the result for us, or this is what we're to think about, the good news of the Ark of God coming into Jerusalem, or the good news of Palm Sunday. It's like a Cinnabon. It's like a cinnamon roll. It's this good smell that you have in your mind, right? Like Jerry Seinfeld, the secret ingredient to all things good, cinnamon. You know, whenever something's good, you say, oh, what is that? Well, I added cinnamon. Okay. Well, this, this Sunday we look at four Palm Sundays and the good news, the aroma of Palm Sunday. And number one, if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that this morning. Number one, Palm Sunday, Jesus Day. Okay, Palm Sunday in Jesus Day. So Jesus entered Jerusalem to be present and enthroned with his people forever. When you think of Palm Sunday, think about that. Jesus enters Jerusalem, and it's, it's foreshadowed for us in the Ark of God entering into Jerusalem. We'll talk about that. But Jesus enter, enters into Jerusalem to be present with his people and to be enthroned by him. And we see that as we look at Palm Sunday and we looked at John 12 and, and we read as well from uh, one of the Gospels too in our call to worship this morning about Jesus entering in to be with his people and his people's responses of, of uh, uh, at least tentatively, enthroning him over them. Uh, so you, you look at this and you say a couple of things. One, realize that as the Old Testament is given to us, uh, the New Testament says it's all 
foreshadowing of Jesus. So Jesus says in Luke 24 to his disciples on the Emmaus Road, the Moses, the Law, and the Prophets all speak of me. How could you be so, so slow to learn, so slow to understand that the Christ must suffer and on the third day rise again? All Moses, the Law, the Prophets, the Psalms speak of me. Uh, we see in the book of Hebrews as well, it says the same thing, that all the, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it all spoke forward to Jesus. And so we look at the Old Testament and say, how does it speak forward to Jesus and the gospel? And it's this, and you've got an A and B there. Jesus is David. Now, we know this. Jesus is called the son of David throughout his earthly life. Jesus is David. Okay, secondly, and he's son of David, literally, by DNA. And then secondly, B, Jesus is the Ark of God. The Ark of God foreshadowed Jesus himself. The Ark of God is about Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus would represent. And it represented those things in a tentative way with God's people in Old Testament Israel. And so we look here in this passage and we see chapter, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. This is David amidst his people, and his people are enthroning him. Okay. David reigned seven years over his own people, the tribe of Judah. But then he reigned 33 years, and that's what we have at, in, in chapter 5. All the rest of Israel, the, the other 11 tribes, come to David and say, you're really rightfully our king. You're in the midst of us right now, right here, and they uh, uh, get in covenant with David. And he is their king over them, their reigning king in their, in their midst. Okay, so Jesus is, is David. This is what God's people do with David uh, during David's own day. But Jesus is also the ark of God. Uh, we look there in 6, verse 2, chapter 6, verse 2. And we see something here, what God says about the Ark of God. This is the Ark of the Covenant made famous, famous in our day by Harrison Ford and Steven Spielberg in Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? It's the Ark of the Covenant. It was at the very center point, the most sacred point of the temple or the tabernacle in Israel. And there was a, an outer court. And then there was a holy place, and then inside the holy place was another wall, and that was the Holy of Holies. It was a square in the middle of the temple, in essence. And in that, the, the very centerpiece of that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And God says, both here and in the Psalms, that he was enthroned between the cherubim of the Ark. Now, the Ark was a box, and it wasn't that big. It was about the size of this here, you know, about from, from the, the table here on up, like this. And on top of the Ark... There was a, a cherubim or like an angelic feature, a heavenly creature that was uh, uh, golden and one over here too. And their wings spread out. So they were like this, one over here and then one over here. And they were attached to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And these were the cherubim. And the Ark of the Covenant had a lid, but it was also called a seat. It's called a mercy seat. And what this represented and what God was, was he was present with his people. And he says, I am enthroned between the cherubim. My presence is here with you, with the Ark of the Covenant. And this is why the Ark of the Covenant was so important for the people. This is why the people lead with the Ark of the Covenant as they circle Jericho, you know, those seven times and then seven times on that last day. Okay. Um, they, God is with them. He's fighting for them. He's going out before them in battle. This is why God's people, when they cross the Jordan River to go into the promised land, they lead with the ark of God. The priests are carrying the ark of God. And when the priest's feet touch the water of the Jordan River, the water parts. It's signifying that God would fight the battle for them. This was God's very presence among them. God is enthroned between the cherubim. Chapter 6, verse 2. What the ark of God meant was God was present with his people. And God put his very presence in the center of the temple, in the center of the capital city of God's people, Jerusalem, in the center of the, the promised land. And so Jesus is this. Matthew 1.23. Emmanuel, God with us. 
the meaning of the Ark of the, Co- uh, the, of the Ark of the Covenant, that God was enthroned, reigning over his people, but present with his people there at the Ark of the Covenant. This seat, this mercy seat, was a seat of a throne. The Ark of God is a throne seat. And the Old Testament refers to it that way as well. And so the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem and it meant God was reigning over his people and that was a good thing and the people were rejoicing. And it meant God was present with his people and that was a good thing because when he was present, their enemies were defeated. When he was present, they could have comfort and security. And so they're rejoicing and they're jumping up and down and David is dancing and he doesn't care what anyone thinks of him. He's so happy and he's distraught when he thinks he's not going to be able to get the ark of God into Jerusalem to be into the center of God's people because this was such a good thing. So Jesus is this. He is God with us, and he is is our king. And his rulership over us means many, many good things that we'll talk about this morning, but the Ark of the Covenant and David himself, these two images, David king over Israel and the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem, one next to another, the palace beside the temple, are all foreshadowings of Jesus. In Jesus, these two things become one. They're together. Jesus is the Ark. He is David. He's king and he's present with his people. So this passage speaks to that uh, to, to us today. Jesus entered Jerusalem to be present and enthroned with his people forever, which brings us to point two. We know that God's people only initially at Palm Sunday received Jesus as their king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Those are their words. It's printed for you too on your call to worship there. They acknowledged him as king of Israel. They called him son of David. Do you get it? This is going on. The king has returned. We now have a descendant of David who will be our king. And they're rejoicing over this just like they rejoiced when David and the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem and everybody danced. But number two, Palm Sunday in our day. God's people didn't receive Jesus king ultimately. Uh, They would crucify him uh, five days later. Um, He wasn't the kind of king that they wanted. Uh, So that brings us to Palm Sunday, our day. Number two, Jesus has entered the heavenly Jerusalem. Jesus has entered the heavenly Jerusalem and is there today. That is how he he is present with, point one, he's present with and enthroned over his people. See, Jesus knew he would be crucified. He told his disciples over and over, when we go into Jerusalem, I'll be handed over to the Gentiles and I'll be crucified. But he still comes into Jerusalem to be present with and enthroned by and king over his people. But the way he does it is through the crucifixion. Through the crucifixion. Through his ascension on high, which we read about in Acts chapter 1, which we witness from a heavenly perspective in Revelation chapter 5, both of which Nate read for us this morning. So Jesus has entered in our day. Jesus has entered the heavenly Jerusalem and is there today. Ark and king are there in the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, I've listed it for you there. Hebrews 12 speaks of the Jerusalem above. It says, every Christian has come not to the earthly Zion, not to the earthly Jerusalem. We don't make pilgrimages to Israel today, geographical Israel, geographical Jerusalem. If you want to go there, that's fine. But we don't make pilgrimages there. That's not the Jerusalem to which we belong. The Jerusalem to which we belong, Hebrews 12 says, is the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion above, where Jesus is. That's the hill he ascended as the ark of God ascended this hill in 2 Samuel chapter 6. So the heavenly Jerusalem Jesus has entered, and we see him entering into it in Acts chapter 1, where his disciples see him uh, enter into heaven. They watch him go up. And then in Revelation 5, we see heaven's there while Jesus is incarnated on the earth. And there's this scroll that contains the names of all people who will be saved. 
And John tears up because he sees there's no one in heaven who's worthy to take the scroll and read who will be saved, who will be in the new heavens and new earth, who has security before God. The names of everybody who does are on this scroll, but it's sealed with seven seals, and there's nobody worthy to open the seals and to read the names. And so John starts crying. But the angel there knows, or one of the elders knows, don't cry, he tells John. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the ultimate King David, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who's been slain, who then appears in heaven, being ascended, arriving from from Acts 1, ascending into heaven, is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For he, with his blood, purchased us. He bought the rights to open that scroll. He is worthy by his life and death to open those seals for us. That's good news. Jesus has done this for us. That's cause for greater rejoicing than we see here with David, isn't it? So, Palm Sunday in our day. Jesus has entered to the heavenly Jerusalem. He's there today. And so, A, for us, in your life now, the message is this. Make Jesus your king. Make Jesus your king. Whether you are an unbeliever today still or whether you're a believer, make Jesus your king in all things. We see in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, Jesus had been king over Judah, but he hadn't been king over all God's people. And finally, God's people in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, look at their words there. They figure out how wise it would be for us, how good it would be for David to be our king. See, even when Saul was reigning as our king, it was you who let us out. You were our military leader. And as we've sung in our military songs, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. You're the successful leader. You brought brought us blessing. You've conquered our enemies, so we want you to be our king. And that's the call for us as believers. If you're a believer today, make Jesus your king in everything you're doing. When he commands you to do something, do it. Have him be your king in that thing. Or if you're an unbeliever today, this is an encouragement to you. Have Jesus as your king. He is the one who will conquer all your enemies. Be like those people in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Or or verses 17 and 18 in chapter 6. Look there. David, king of Israel, wanted to make sure that everybody knew God was their real king. And he was just the human presenting the will of the true king in his place. And so what's he do? He pitches a tent for the Ark of the Covenant. He makes a place in the center of Jerusalem. So that would be the centerpiece. And that's what God wants from us. That we pitch a tent, so to speak, for God being present and being king in our lives. So we bring this present God uh, from uh, verses 1 and 2. The God who's enthroned between the cherubim, we make him king. We pitch a tent tent for him in our lives. Now, uh, just almost a side note here. Um, Not having, that's your number one there, not having Jesus uh, lead you, not having him be your king, not having Jesus lead you is a curse. And and scripture wants you to see that. Um, Not having David as king in Israel was a curse. Having Saul as king in Israel was a curse. And Saul is given to Israel as a curse because Saul is a king like the nations. David is a king who's not like the nations. He's a king like God described the king should be in Deuteronomy 17. He was a king who was a servant, who was a shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep. Saul was somebody who sent a little shepherd boy out instead of laying his own life out before Goliath. 
Saul was not a good shepherd. He was not a servant. He used God's people for his own benefit. But David lays his life out for the benefit of God's, for the benefit of God's people. It's good news for Jesus to be your king. And not having Jesus lead you is a curse. Um, under King Saul, the Philistines uh, uh, were knocking God's people around. They were oppressing God's people. Not having David as their king was a curse. Saul was insane for a part of his kingship over Israel. That was a curse upon them. Having Saul as their king meant that they might lose their homes, that they might lose in battle, that they might have their land taken over by Philistines or whatever invading army came in. Now, today in the church in the United States, people say Jesus is not king yet. And they're saying we want the curse. In effect, in substance. To say that Jesus can tell me what to do, no, that's not for me, that's legalism. It is bad news if Jesus is not your king. And that's what Saul proves. The book of Judges proves that as well. When David is not your king, when, when there is no king in Israel, everybody does what is right in their own eyes. And they're oppressed by one person, or by one nation after another, after another, after another. It is a curse not to have David reminding you of what God has you to do. It's a curse not to have Jesus leading you. Because Jesus loves you more than you love yourself. He cares more about your soul than you care about your own soul. He cares more about your body more than you care about your own body. It's a curse not having Jesus lead you. Why a curse? Because A, you'll do stupid things. Okay? I do stupid things when I don't do the commands of Jesus. When I do what seems best in my own eyes, what seems right in my own eyes, I do stupid things. You know what David was doing when he first brought the ark of God in? Stupid things. He puts the ark on a cart. Now, how many, how many uh, Hebrew letters did God spill out in the law, the books of Moses, talking about how to carry the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant had these rings on it. So you could thread these rings through with these big, long poles so that the, the uh, particular people, the, the, uh, the privileged uh, priests, the privileged Levites that were assigned to carrying these sacred things of God could slide the pole through and they wouldn't have to touch the Ark. Because God is holy and he is present there. And, and so they're supposed to slide these, these uh, poles through and, and carry the ark in that way. And they had done that in the wilderness for 40 years. But David does what is right in his own eyes and he puts the, car, he puts the ark on an ox cart. And so then, of course, the ox stumbles and, and Uzzah reaches out to, because it hits a big mess and then Uzzah loses his life. When you do things based on what you think would be good, it's stupid and you pay for it. Okay? And, and we, we naturally do sinful things. So Jesus wants to keep us from doing the stupid things we would have done without listening to him. B, why a curse? Well, it's also a curse not only to you personally when you're not walking in line with what Jesus commands us to do, but it's also a curse for the church. If you act not in accordance with the way Jesus tells you to be, if you're not loving, if you're not patient, if you're not kind, if you're not forgiving, if you don't speak truth, if you're not honest, uh, if you're not humble, these are all things Jesus calls us to. If we're not those ways, if we're obnoxious, if we're prideful, if we're not patient, then no one will see Christianity as a positive thing. Oh yeah, that guy goes to church and he's a real jerk. That guy goes to church and he's so pompous. That guy goes to church and he looks down at me and I always feel condemned when I'm around him. No one will see Christianity as a positive thing because of your behavior. If Jesus isn't your king. We talked about last week, the, the character of Jesus 
is eminently attractive to every human soul. And so when we see stories in movies and TV and when we read it or we hear stories in the news, this is what we talked about when that that, uh, high school uh, uh, had the the prison team, the high school or the, the prison high school basketball team comes into their school to play them and they they assign like 80% of their school to root for the prison team, our hearts rejoice. That's the character of God. Um, Those who are downtrodden get lifted up. That's what God does. That's what he did to us in the gospel. We were downtrodden, beaten to death on this earth. We didn't deserve to, for good treatment, just like these prison kids. They were in, in this prison because they had committed felonies. They had killed people. But they were just juveniles, so they weren't being you know, pr- imprisoned in the same way. They didn't deserve this treatment of the 80%, but yet our hearts rejoice because this is the image of God in us. leaps out and says, that's right. That's the way God is. He's merciful to people who don't deserve it. And we should be like this on earth. We should treat people who haven't been supported by a single person all our lives. We should be like that with people who are in these circumstances. And so when we follow Jesus in the things we're doing, that's attractive to people. That draws them into the church. Hey, that guy's a believer? I should check out his church. Every other Christian I know is a jerk. Right? This is why we as Christians get made fun of in the media. It's because we're jerks. It's because we're not acting like Jesus. It's because not Jesus is not our king. It's because we say, oh, grace, grace, that means I can do anything. That's not graciousness. That's not the mercy of God. The mercy of God is him telling us how to live. He's framed us. And when we don't live according to our frame, it screws our lives up. If it's grace, grace, and we go through five wives, that's not blessing. Grace is God telling us, no, forgive your wife. No, be kind to your wife. You know, if we do that, we have one wife. And that's blessing to us. That's blessing to our children, too. One set of parents at at, at Christmas time. So it's a positive thing. If we are like Jesus, if he is our king, it's a positive thing for Christianity. And if we don't act like Jesus, no one will come into the church. That's your next blank. Because of you. We want people to come into the church because of the way we behave. Because of the way we treat people, we want people to come into the church. We want people on a a different scale, a little bit, to come back to our church because of the way they're treated here. And and you folks do a good job. You folks do a good job at that. You know, the Philistines thought Israel was a joke. Um, They owned the Ark of the Covenant because God's people had not obeyed God's law. And the Ark of God was out with the Philistines since the early chapters of 1 Samuel. Um, before Saul was even uh, king over God's, over God's people. And the Philistines did not want to be blessed by Israel's God because Israel's people were fools, and they were easy to conquer. We want to be like Jesus, so that Christianity is a positive thing. That doesn't mean being fake. Part of being like Jesus is being humble. When you sin, own it. And that's attractive to the people around you. Okay, so... Uh, so the, you want to be like Jesus so that Christianity is a positive thing and so that people will come into the church by you. Okay, but with Jesus as your king, four blessings. Four blessings that we see here in this passage. Four blessings, four things, four benefits. A, you will be led, if Jesus is your, your king, you'll be led in wisdom. You'll be led in wisdom. Five to, chapter 5, verse 2. God's people finally decide, hey, we're going to be led in wisdom. The other, the ten tribes in the north had been led by Ishbosheth, the, the king of Saul's son. And they said, enough of that. We want to be led by David because David is wise. Uh, John 10, 4 through 9. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he's talking in a kingly way. 
David was shepherd king over God's people. So when Jesus proclaims himself as the good shepherd, he's proclaiming himself as king. And he says, if I'm your shepherd, you'll hear my voice. If you're my sheep, you will hear my voice and you'll follow me and you will find pasture. Jesus knows where the pasture is. He knows where to eat the stuff that's good for our soul. And he takes us to it so that we're prospering inside, so that our souls are prospering regardless of what's going on in our lives and the circumstances around us. If Jesus is our king, we'll be led in wisdom. And as king, here's how he leads you. He will lead you by his directives in the Bible. Okay, He'll lead you by his directives in the Bible. Okay, we see this in, in 5, uh, 6, and six and 7 there. Um, God had spoken to his people that he would have a city for himself where he would dwell among them with the Ark of the Covenant. And that city was Jerusalem. Now, the word was on the street and among the Jebusites who were not Israelites who owned Jerusalem, who lived there, because we're a city that sits on top of a hill, and because we have city walls, we can defeat David with the lame and the blind. (laughs) Those who can't walk around, and those who can't even see their enemies. Because all you have to do if you're defending Jerusalem is find out where the, the, you know, the edge of the wall is, sit on top of the wall, and, you know, toss a stone down upon there, and the stone goes rolling down, and it breaks the legs of those who are trying to conquer Jerusalem. So common wisdom is don't attack Jerusalem. Just leave it alone. But David leads his people in wisdom because Jerusalem is the city in which God will place his name as he spoke to Moses. And so David leads in wisdom because he follows the directives of God. We need Jerusalem because this is the place where God will put his name, which, by which he meant his ark, his presence. And so David leads in contrary to our own wisdom. Jesus leads us contrary to our, to our own wisdom. And that's, that's what God's word does to us. Um, it leads us away from the foolish things that we would do that would bring us grief. And it causes us to do the things often contrary to our inclinations, like putting the ark on a cart. Okay, when we look to God's word, we don't put the ark on a cart. When we look to God's word, we attack Jerusalem because we say, this is the place God told Moses he'd put his name. So we attack it. Of course we do. And David defeats it anyway. And he conquers Jerusalem so that he can bring the ark into the place where the ark was to reside, where the ark was to dwell. So that's one. We take Jesus as our king because he leads us in wisdom. And he leads us in wisdom through his word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We want lives that are prosperous for our souls. And they're prosperous for our souls when we're not doing as we think best. The cart, not taking Jerusalem, but as we do according to his word. So we look to his word. We look to his commands in scripture. We look to the character of God that we see in scripture and we follow that. B, second blessing. Uh, We we follow Jesus as our king because with that in place, with him in place as our king, we will always have with us God's presence. We want Jesus to be our king because it means that God will be present with us. If David's our king, guess what? We get the presence of God with us in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Didn't happen all during Saul's reign. Didn't happen all during the, the time of the book of Judges from the time we lost the, for, or from the beginning of 1 Samuel, from the time we lost the ark. We didn't have God's presence with us. But if David is our king, we do. Because David conquers Jerusalem. And then once Jerusalem is conquered, he goes and gets the ark to put it in Jerusalem so that God's presence is with us. And this is the case for anyone on this earth who makes Jesus his king. God is present with him. And that's what you got here in uh, uh, John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus tells his disciples, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
God by his spirit is present with all who have Jesus as their shepherd or king. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says the Holy Spirit indwells each follower of Jesus, each person who believes in him. So with Jesus as our king, he is always present with us. Third thing, C, with Jesus as your king, you will be blessed in this life. You'll be blessed in this life. Uh, David puts the ark to the side. He gives it to Obed-Edom, the Gittite, uh, because he's afraid to carry the ark any longer. And apparently he goes home and reads his Bible and then comes back and says, okay, let's put it on some poles and take it into Jerusalem. And let's do sacrifices every six feet, just in case. Um, but uh, he finds out, verses 11 and 12 in chapter 6, Obed-Edom, that's my favorite name in scripture, Obed-Edom. Um, Obed-Edom uh, gets blessed by the Lord. And David is told the house of Obed-Edom has been blessed because the Ark of the Covenant is here. And so David says, you know what? That's my responsibility. I'm king. I'm the one who's the mediator through whom God's people should be blessed. I need to get the Ark into Jerusalem. God blesses us in our lives as Jesus is our king, as his presence is with us. So verses 18 through 20 there's this great blessing. And we have this scene of celebration once the ark of God, once the presence of God is in Jerusalem, once the king of God's choosing David is in Jerusalem, the city that will bear the presence, the name of God uh, amongst his people. By the way, that's the language of John 1. Jesus came, he, he created the world, and he came to those who were his own, his own did not receive him. That's the cross. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the proclamation of the gospel. And, and then it says, and he came to be with us, to dwell with us. That's tabernacle language. That's, that's uh, temple language. And so that's what's going on here. Uh, but when Jesus, when David is your king, when the Ark of the Covenant is in Jerusalem, that is a good thing. It is not a bummer to have Jesus as your king. If Jesus is your king, you have eternal life. If Jesus is present in you by his spirit, you have the fruit of the spirit being uh, uh, bleeding out of you in increasing measure. If you have Jesus as your king, you have peace with God through his cross. If Jesus is king, you have fellowship with his people, and that's a sweet thing. You have better friends here in the church than anywhere else because they're kinder people to you. If Jesus is your king, you have relational harmony as far as it's up to you, as Paul says in, in Romans 12. You know, if you're kind with people, if you're patient with them, if you do things for them, if you are humble before them, you will have better relationships. Now, some people will still just not want to be your friend, and there's nothing you can do about that. But you'll have peace with men more so. You'll have better relationships with Jesus as your king, with your wife, with your kids, with your co-workers, because of the character of Jesus that's being developed in you. If Jesus is your king, you'll be living in wisdom instead of foolishness. And if Jesus is your king, you'll have comfort in life and death, as we read about in our Heidelberg Catechism question one this morning. What's my only hope in life and in death? Everything Jesus has done for me. That's the answer. Jesus is with me, and he does everything I need. Okay. We have comfort in life and death. When hard circumstances are upon us, Jesus is still there with us. Now, how is this blessedness in life with Jesus as our king signified? Well, it's signified in verse 19. Raisin cakes, date cakes, cinnabons. There's a sweet aroma with being a Christian. Everybody's celebrating. That was, the, that was the greatest thing they could have. So think of your favorite dessert. And that's raisin, back then it was raisin cakes and date cakes. That was the sweetest, most wonderful thing they could have. And everybody gets you know, a loaf of bread and a raisin cake and a, and a date cake. And they get, they get sent home. This is signifying the blessing you have. How sweet life is when David is your king and the presence of God is amidst his people. And this is how sweet life is when Jesus is your king and his presence is in your life and in the midst of God's people. It's, raised, it's a sweet aroma of 
Cinnabons, right? Okay. And then D, with Jesus as your king, you will be blessed as well into in your eternity. You'll be blessed in your eternity. You'll be blessed in your eternity because Jesus as your king, bringing into your life God's presence, also offered himself as a sacrifice to keep you safe from the judgment you deserve. So we see David offering these sacrifices as he brings the presence of God to his people. We see David doing that. And we see Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and he brings a sacrifice into Jerusalem as well, doesn't he? It's the sacrifice of himself. He brings the sacrifice of himself into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You say, okay, I brought, I brought the sacrifice. Where is it, Jesus? Well, it's me. He brings the sacrifice in so that we have peace with God into eternity because the wrath of God against all our sins, all the sins of those who have David, the son of David as their king, Jesus as their king, all the wrath of God against our sins gets spilled out in that one perfect sacrifice on the Sunday after Palm Sunday. So number three, last thing. We talk about, that's Palm Sunday in our day. Palm Sunday in our day, it's this Jesus reigning in heaven, the praise presence being with us, him reigning over us in our day. But there's a Palm Sunday yet to come, a Palm Sunday one day in the future. That is, you will be led, you'll be blessed by, you'll be in God's presence unharmed perfectly because there's a final Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus will, here's your blank, when Jesus will, return. When Jesus re will return, and this time he's not entering into the heavenly Jerusalem like at his ascension where he is today in the heavenly Jerusalem, but this is when Jesus brings the Jerusalem above down to us. And that's Revelation 21. That's Revelation 21. Jesus brings God's presence to us to dwell with us, his people forever, and to sit as our king forever. That's the Palm Sunday to which we look. And so as we think about today, Palm Sunday, and what Jesus was signifying, he was signifying that I will be with you, and I will guide you, and I will lead you, and that will be blessing upon your life. That'll be raisin cake upon raisin cake in your life. That's the good news of the gospel symbolized for us in Jesus coming into Jerusalem on this day 2,000 years ago. Let's rejoice in that, and let's now pray.